Hi everyone and welcome to the British Esports Education Podcast. I'm Callum Neal, Head of Education, uh, and I'm really pleased to be joined by two guests today. We've got Rich from Ruckus Networks and also Paul from Sunderland College. Um, just to give a little bit of an overview in terms of today's podcast, as many of you will know, as British Esports, we launched our education programmes in 2020 uh, with Pearson, uh, the Level 2 and Level 3 BTEX. To date, we've had almost 10,000 young people that have studied those qualifications. We've since branched out now more into level one and level two leadership and also the level four, level five, higher nationals, as well as degree options as well. So what we've seen over the last four or five years is this growth in schools, colleges, universities, all coming on board and developing esports solutions. One of the things that many people don't consider straight away when looking to implement esports is the network solution. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be joined today by Rich from Ruckus Networks and Paul from the college. Um, just to hand over to you, uh, Rich and Paul, if you'd just like to introduce yourselves, tell everybody who you are, what your role is. Sure. Um, Rich from Ruckus Networks. I focus purely on the education market in the UK and Ireland. And it's my role to make sure that our customers essentially get a network that's not only fit for what we think is the primary purpose of connecting pupils and devices to the network, but also something that enables these future wider initiatives to actually really engage pupils. And that's hopefully the benefit we can bring. Uh, I'm Paul Donnelly. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a lecturer at Sunderland College uh, at the Games and Esports. Uh, I've been teaching esports for five years within the Northeast, uh, the esports level three BTEC and the level two as well. Um, so I've been teaching that over, you know, different places. Um, currently here at Sunderland College uh, in this amazing facility in the NEPC. Nice lead in. Thank you very much. Yes, we are here at the NEPC. Um, so that's the National Esports Performance Campus and uh, British Esports in development of this campus. We've worked with Ruckus um, as our preferred network provider here for the campus and, and as British Esports. And effectively for us, this campus is it's multi-purpose it's got lot there are lots of different users of, of that campus so just before we go into some of the details of that and some of our requirements and why we needed to work with ruckus and why we chose to do so um rich can you just tell us a bit more about ruckus networks who are you what do you do as a company as an organization and then in particular within education sure so ruckus started out quite well quite a few years ago in excess of 20 years ago um making wireless products and we were famous for developing Wi-Fi products for particularly challenging environments. So if you think of lots of hospitality customers, lots of hotels, lots of places where, to be honest, they have difficult environments, difficult old-fashioned buildings, much like, obviously, the building we're in today. Um, also, environments where they don't necessarily have hands-on staff that want to manage that network. Um, and they want to have lots of clients connecting at high speed, very similar to obviously what we're doing with esports. Um, for education now, it's not just wireless, it's also the wired network, but more importantly, it's actually the management of that. You know, I, I always say, and I shouldn't say this, but uh, kind of anyone can make you know, a half decent switch or a half decent piece of Wi-Fi, but it's actually, how do you actually manage that, constrain it and make it operate the way that you want to for you know for your purposes. So yeah. that's, that's kind of our background. Yeah, and and absolutely right as well. This this building that we're in now, for those of you that haven't seen the National Esports Performance Campus, we are effectively three parts to the campus. We have the arena, um, which is over by the Stadium of Light, which is 150, 200 seater arena, you know, content creation studios, modern state of the art environment. Where we are here at the place, this is an education and business hub, and we have three gaming houses. This building that we're sat in at the moment is is sort of the corner between the place and the houses and was constructed in, in the 1800s. So there's been a lot of redevelopment from a construction perspective to get this building and to modernise it whilst also maintaining all of those original features. But then absolutely, that then becomes a really challenging environment when thinking about the need for performance, the need for connectivity, the high-speed network. So again, um, that's where we've we've engaged uh, with Ruckus. Paul, just from, from your point of view, before we come back to the sort of infrastructure in place here, um, 
what is it that Sunderland College are doing here in this building? What are the range of things that students are involved in? So obviously the first thing that we really do is we deliver the level three and level two BTECs uh, with our student cohorts. Uh, we, we run the extended uh, over the two years and we have our level two as well. We're also looking to kind of push into higher levels as well, which is quite exciting. Uh, we'll find out maybe more about that like later on, maybe. Um, so that's really exciting. On top of that, we also uh, compete in the British Esports Student Champs uh, with our team, Sunderland Sears, who are performing fantastic this year already, uh, really pushing for those finals uh, and uh, being the champs again this year, uh, continuing that record. Uh, we deliver all, uh, the entire curriculum um, of, of, of the, the level three. Um, that's everything from the... Um, the computer networking side, also the, the your performance, uh, health, fitness, business as well. You know, some really nice sort of um, just general classrooms that we can kind of have our space in. But obviously, the big uh, the big space, which is all those big uh, nice PCs uh, with Alienware kit, which is fantastic. Uh, it's it's so incredible uh, for the students to have those facilities available and just kind of reeling off a little bit what you were saying earlier obviously about the importance of having that infrastructure as well um you know the the peace of mind for uh us staff uh, and having that uh, the 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 system to be um readily available um having the network and, and having the solution of it fixing itself and doing everything it needs to do kind of takes a lot of weight off us um and allows us to deliver the the curriculum uh, and give the students the most exceptional experience p possible anywhere. Yeah, and I think it just just seeing that yesterday for a time, I came into one of the classes designing students in there, looking at analysis of, of gameplay and, and footage and making sure, I think it's that readily available part that whenever we need it, it's there. And, and the, the amazing part about when you walk into one of these classroom environments, as you said, is We've got the, you know, we have a, a partnership with Dell and Intel and, and Alienware supply some of the machines. So we've got i7 and i9 machines across the campus. They've got um, 4080 graphics cards, 360 hertz monitors, best in class hardware. But if it's not going to connect to the internet and if it's not going to work, we've got a huge problem, haven't we? So from your point of view, it's just what's your advice to schools, to colleges, to anyone who's looking to move into this space? Because I think it's that, that piece that some people forget. Think it through. Yeah. <laughs> um, think of every conceivable use for that network because it's very easy to think of the games, the sport aspects. That well, it must be high speed, always on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But always remember that there's someone upstairs like us now, <laughs> operating in a completely different way with a completely different demand on the network. But we all need to be in sync. It could be us, it could be wider media contacts, it could be coaches, it could be trainers that are looking at different aspects. It all needs to be able to connect. Now, obviously what we've got here is nothing short of like super professional. We, we all agree, and that's why you know, obviously you, you guys love coming in and teaching here. But actually, for the average school out there, or the average institution, they just want something that's particularly flexible to set up. You don't need to make a huge investment on day one, necessarily. You know, you might want a network that you can just pop up, for example, for these things, um, that, you know, perhaps uses templates to, to get that configured and set up, but you can then strip it down again, you know, at, at the end of that session. But in terms of what people should look out for, it's, it's pretty simple. Can you firstly set up that network in a straightforward way? We don't want to put too much pressure on already overburdened IT staff, to be quite frank. Secondly, how do we onboard any given device in a secure way? Yeah. How can I make sure that, for example, a pupil's laptop, when doing their regular curr uh, curriculum, connects and is given one particular firewall policy? However, when it's competition time on that same laptop, laptop potentially with a different login how do they get access to the various cloud platforms they need to be able to compete so that's how do we get them on board and make sure that they're all secure and segmented and obviously safeguarding is put in place once they're on there we will we all think you know we should be able to relax now but of course we can't because we work in IT and we're always waiting for something to go wrong this is where really we should be able to set up and AI should be able to help us really defining what good looks like and maintaining and monitoring that. We, ideally, we want to be able to gauge if something is beginning to go wrong. 
you know, use the data we have to say, hang on, this isn't quite the same as it was yesterday. I'm seeing a little bit of a difference here. At that point, potentially we can preempt troubleshooting. I don't like the stress of troubleshooting because you know what happens? You make a silly decision. You're under pressure. I will just make that fix one it quick. Fix it, get it fixed. Yeah. People are shouting at you. And that's great. It might stop one person shouting at you. But I guarantee you've messed someone else's life up instead. Um, and you just don't need that pressure. Yeah. And that's really, I think, what we're all about now is just having a, a simple, stable platform, learning from what you know our previous demanding customers in hospitality, if you will, learning from the fact that post-COVID it's getting increasingly hard to find you know, hugely experienced IT people. Like, I don't know how they do it, but if you're in a school, you've got to be an expert on everything. An expert on the phone system, the network, your, you know, your cloud-based storage or your cloud-based you know, applications, um, IoT, security cameras, smart boards. The list is endless. So as far as I'm concerned, what I do is the boring piece, and it should remain so. Um, I should be able to take that burden away from you so, frankly, you can focus on doing what you do best, which is, which is teaching or in, you know, rolling out new applications that are going to increase engagement in the classroom. Because you know, us three here, really, our sole aim should be how do we increase engagement within the classroom and therefore create better outcomes. Absolutely. And how, it, for the pe people that might be listening to this now that are either involved in esports already and they've made a start and things might be working or they're about to move into esports, how do I know if the network that I'm using is right? How, how do I know that that's working properly? How do I know whether I'm a teacher, whether I'm an IT director, whether I'm senior leader in, in a college? I want to embed an esports program, I see the value, I see the engagement, I see the outcomes. How, how do I know if what we've got is actually the right thing? You need to involve experts. And personally, I would be calling on you guys or calling on your, your partner that you work with currently today around the network. But first and foremost, yeah. get in touch with the guys at British Esports because there is so much more to this than the network. Don't get me wrong, the network's a, you know, potentially a huge stumbling block, but there's the network, there's the lines, there's potentially even the drivers on the machines. All of this will play you know, into it being a success. And all, all we want is for, you know, this to be a successful rollout. So I think, yeah, engage with us. Let us have a simple review of what that, what capabilities does your current network have? Is it likely to fit? Yeah. You know, have you got, uh, say, the, the necessary service provider lines, are, for me, are probably the most important thing to start with. I think it's... Um it's often something that's a little bit of an unknown as well, isn't it, for lots of people. We often get, you know, really enthusiastic curriculum leads or teachers or people within departments saying, I understand that we need to deliver this and I can see the value of it. Or it might be the opposite way that within senior leadership, there's a directive that comes down. And either way, that comes to the IT person within that organisation that mm. we're about to do esports. And then we get lots of, is it going to be safe? Is it going to be secure? How do I protect the rest of my network? And then you've got all of those other users. I mean, for us in this building, thinking about, again, why we engage with Ruckus so closely uh, from a network perspective is we've got an arena that's going to be operational and events are going to be happening. We can't have mid-game the network just stop. Yeah. And therefore, what's happening if that's a live event, if it's a, a major team, if it's a professional team that's in at the same time, we could have three different teams in our gaming houses. They could be scrimming, they could be streaming, they could be performing, they could be, they might need to do updates on certain things. They might then be on the mobile devices, tablets, they might be streaming on smart TVs. Then we've got the business center. So we've got multiple people on laptops, on, you know, on Teams calls, you know, us recording something. We've got students in a classroom. So we've got all of these things that are happening that are all different. And again, I'm sort of thinking about that from my perspective, I'm going, how do I know that when, as a teacher, or when we're in a fixture, that that's going to work? What how, what does the network do, or what needs to be in place well, to help and facilitate that? Essentially, decent, sensible configuration. It's All we're doing is traffic shaping. But we, first off, need to appreciate every type of use case. It's very easy to guarantee service, to guarantee 
um, you know, bandwidth for a particular application. And that's fine. That's the easy bit in some respects. We can make sure the games are operating correctly. But most schools, one of their big concerns is, well, what about the wider lessons that are going on? Is it going to be impacted by this? And we say, no, no, no. What we can do is we can make sure that each device, each user, dependent upon where they are, what time of day it is, we can give them a different rule, a different policy, which guarantees what performance they get, what they're allowed to access, what they are not allowed to access, and so on. And as, as such, you can carve up your network in a way that suits you. Yeah. What's your experience been then, Paul, in terms of, you know, from, from a teaching side of things and the needs that you've had from a teaching learning assessment side, but then also as we start to move into the student champs and the competition and the teams that are training and practicing and then playing on, on match days? Yes. Yeah, so the thing is with esports, you know, it's, it's it's looking from like a curriculum like standpoint. Um, when you look at kind of the rest of kind of the types of curriculums that are out there and there's different things you can study, it's so unique in its, its demand for the likes of a high-speed network that's controlled, that's secure. It, it requires the, the students and staff to kind of start diving into, you know, applications that, you know, can create these kind of safeguard and security risks. Um, so it's important to have that infrastructure ready to, you know, protect them in that way, uh, making sure that you uh, cr create a healthy environment to provide a good, healthy um, uh, learning experience for the students so you don't have those stops and starts all the time. Um, but also making sure that, you know, they're safe um, and you have it to, like secure and that, you know, not data is not getting leaked and things like that. Because most of the courses that, that, that I'm aware of, you know, they, they might need a network for you, may do some research and Google, typical things like that. But uh, esports, when you start diving to live streaming uh, and start sending information outwards, you need that to be protected. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the other thing actually maybe side of that would, would be like media and film, I guess. Um, but even like the likes of IT and things, you know, you have your research and um, you start diving into a bit more newer territory. And I think a lot of, um, you know, other colleges and schools I've spoke with uh, who have kind of been interested or are kind of running it, uh, they kind of find that um, it's quite uh, overwhelming. Uh, and sometimes maybe it's, they might have an idea, but also selling it to the, you know, the superiors and such as well, making sure that they fully understand because uh, it's a hard sell sometimes. And when you start presenting these risks, mm. uh, they sometimes go on uh, and costs as well. In many cases, they kind of step back and go, whoa, you know, it's, uh, it's quite overwhelming. Um, but it's such an important part. And like you mentioned already, is that once you have that infrastructure there, you know, you can also apply it to other things across the board as well and make it more secure and then apply it elsewhere, which is just such a, an important aspect that is, is easily overlooked um, 100%, yeah. 100%. I think that the safeguarding is definitely one of the key aspects. And one of the things I learned yesterday was got genuinely quite inspired by was obviously Callum and the teams have worked with the NSPCC, which I, I'm sort of liberally calling uh, safeguarding plus. You know, this is going beyond merely just watching over their, their internet usage and actually giving them, uh, you know, training on, on behaviours they should be looking out for and behaviours they should be adopting. And I think that's, a, you know, that's a marvellous thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, working with the NSPCC, I think the, the, the simplicity of that's where young people are. So that's, if that's the environment that young people are in, we need to understand how do we safeguard them? Yeah. How do we make sure they're protected? How do we make sure that things that they're accessing are the right things that we're accessing? And these are all concerns and worries from colleges thinking about the safeguarding policies. And again, that's something that we support with. So that's something that when colleges will get in touch with us, we'll support them with best practice and we'll support them with advice and guidance to make sure that um, young people are operating in a safe environment. When it comes to our student champs, again, this is not young people just randomly logging into an online server and connecting with anyone anywhere in the world. We know who every single student is because they're registered by the teachers, registered by the centres. So we know it's students competing against students the same age, you know, the, in, a, in a safe environment, ultimately. Um, and I think that's that's a really important message that people understand in terms of what this is from a, an enrichment perspective. Again, Paul, thinking about you guys and the team um, and, and just that that infrastructure that you now have. One of the things that, that we have here, again, luckily, um, attached to the classroom We've got what we call the Sears room, yep, which is yep. a Sunderland Sears performance room, eight PCs in. Um, so that's a separate environment where 
the team going and what are they doing there? Tell us a bit yeah, more about that. Yeah, so we have our two classrooms. We're on the, we have our little secret room in the corner there uh, where our CS team, you know, headphones on. It's, a, it's an intense space. Uh, you know, that's where our, uh, mainly our, our, our Valorant teams uh, and Rocket League teams uh, and the RCL and such have been looking into diving to that as well, which is fantastic. Uh, they're really high performing teams, uh, but they're only really, really able to, to reach their absolute max potential because of the systems that they have available as well. Uh, and it, it does come to play quite a lot you know and and it's such a fantastic space for them um allowing them to to break away from those you know the, the dis disconnects and the lags and it makes sure that when they're in their games they're not having to worry about you know frame drops or anything like that um you know i have a little bit of a golden rule with my esports students and i i it, they don't like me for it but i always say if you lose it's because you suck <laughs> and I always say that, right? Uh, and they say, you know, because, you know, you get lots of excuses and, ah, oh, it's lagging. It's, uh, you know, we've got these delays or things that, that there's things are happening. And I say, well, you don't have it here, you know? So, so, so it's all on you now. So yeah. um, if, the, if the tools are right. Hard truth, yeah. If the tools are wrong, then, then of course, well, they're going to be very quick to realize that and start to blame you, us, aren't they? But yeah. If you think about their practice, they like to practice in a very consistent way the desk height's the same the, the room lighting's the same it's to get them into that that competitive zone it's going to be you know replicated when that when they're in the large tournaments so they can't have any any interruption because it will throw the entire practice session and it's no different from teaching you know non-esports class you know if, if as a teacher you want to uh, i don't know unveil something on the smart board or whatever it might be if that doesn't work first go we all remember back to our school days, the chaos of the dog in the playground or, you know, something doesn't work. And you know what happens? It just ends up being complete chaos. Oh, yeah. I've been and, there myself and the and lesson, the lesson, Exactly. <laughs> the, the lesson is lost just because of that full yeah. start. And that's yes. really what we're here to you know, hopefully avoid. Um, you mentioned AI earlier, this oh, yeah. big scary word that is going to take all of our jobs and you know going to automate everything that we do uh, and paul I'd, I'd like to get your input on that in a little bit as well in <laughs> terms of some of the things that i know you'll be speaking to students about in the classroom and and sort of technology um so if if we're using ruckus networks and ai is supporting that network does that mean that i don't need an ait staff uh, well i would <laughs> like i mean i would like to say you could get away without them um, but no, that, I, that's we could not cope without them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, ultimately, AI is there to amplify talent. It's not there yeah. to replace it. Yeah. Um, but most importantly, it's there to take away some of the drudgery, yeah. some of the mundane tasks, or things that, frankly, you will not pick up. It's there analyzing all of the metadata from every single connection on that network continuously. If it spots a trend, if it spots something that's different, it will come up with recommendations and say, actually, I think the network would be better optimised if you were to do this. Doesn't do it automatically. And, uh, someone help still has to step in and press that button because yeah. it's your, not, your net, net, network rather, rather, rather than the AI. But the beauty of it, and it never really crossed my mind before, but AI doesn't have an ego. So if the AI makes a recommendation, it will later put its hand up and say, I made a mistake there. Yeah. Actually, my improvement wasn't quite as good as I thought it would be. You can roll things back. So it really is there just as a helping hand. You know, it's just a little yeah. bit of a guidance. I, I would almost look at it as a teammate. Yeah, yeah. You know, rather than a team leader as yeah. such. It's just someone going, oh, have you considered doing what do you this? think about this? Yeah. What, yeah. what about in, a, in the classroom, Paul, in terms of, is it something that comes up with students, AI as discussion All the time, you know, I love a good controversial conversation with the students about AI. You know, I always run this small session about Metal Gear Solid 2, if you've ever played that. It is a whole theme about artificial intelligence and censoring like information and things and like the scary side of it really it's always fun to kind of have that discussion with the students but really you know my experience with it it's 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 a fantastic i mean we're talking about maybe chat gpt and things like that and uh, other sort of generating sort of tools available it, you know it, it allows us to take a lot of kind of that rather than spending an hour typing things up for ages, you can kind of give it prompts and give it guidance and it'll support you saying, maybe you can think about this and consider that. And I personally use it for inspiration a lot of the time. You know, maybe there's a couple of ideas and maybe things you're not thinking about. Uh, I even consider like, uh, um, ask the students to, you know, use it as a research tool, you know, to, to get inspiration, not as like a, you know, hey, it's 
take it for fact, but, you know, use it because it can then point you in the right direction. You know, give me some ideas about, you know, the different types of, you know, fitness aspects, uh, uh, the different uh, types of performance, uh, your micro skills, macro skills in this context, you know, it just helps kind of take a bit of the weight off and can kind of clear a lot of the headspace. And it all goes back to what we were saying earlier about making uh, giving them the, the the best experience possible, allowing them to free up mind space, you know, to 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 use it on more practical yeah. things and be a bit more creative. I think you hit the nail on that. Actually, it's it's applied context. Yes. Yeah. It's just something else that helps the individual visualize something. Yeah. And if we can have that yeah. support yeah. Yeah. from our network perspective. It's going to make us more intelligent, isn't it, in terms of what we do and how we operate and ultimately mean that at the end of it, we don't get as many problems or issues. Or... It's not a miracle work. Yeah. You know, but hopefully it can free you up to do the things that, let's be honest, are more exciting. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. The, the things yeah. that make the difference, not plugging in the cable or going to the comms cabinet and rebooting something. No, you shouldn't need to do that. Yeah. You want to be focused on, frankly, what you're famous for. Yeah, and I think what's been what's been really exciting actually for me trying to understand more about the network side of things, which is something that from from being a teacher previously working in esports, you know, I absolutely relied on our IT support team. I made sure that I took them cookies and coffees at Christmas. Make sure you take your IT team cookies and coffees at Christmas, <laughs> um, and say thank you because without them, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do my job at all. So this has been really insightful for me working working with yourselves here to try and understand a little bit more about this and and you know cable Wi-Fi this new exciting thing called Wi-Fi Seven is something that I want to ask you about because I've been on this journey around understanding you know AI and what the network does and then if I if I roll back a few years we had lots of horror stories actually of um, schools or colleges you know having the curriculum discussion before the summer. And then IT team over the summer, they come in and they're going to try and run the esports classroom from Wi Fi, and it was a disaster and it didn't work. So, I suppose question one would be can you run esports from Wi Fi? Um, you're going to prove this out for me, ultimately. Um, in theory, yes. You know, up until now, I would still always say, in the heat of competition, instinctively I'm going to trust the wired network. There's no two ways about it. However, with the latest iteration of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 7, A, we've got three different frequencies to play with, which is good, it's like more traffic lanes if you like to deal with things. But also, most importantly, when Wi-Fi 7 client devices become readily available, they can actually utilise all three of those spectrums at the same time which means you're not subject to interference in quite the same way, or it can kind of uh, drive around the pothole, if you like, of interference, which is great. Um, but also, we can actually dedicate one spectrum, for example, purely to games within a room, and you've got higher throughput. So in theory, it should be possible. And, and what's exciting for me isn't just that I work for a Wi-Fi company, and obviously it's a, it's a great challenge to see if it will perform to that level. But more importantly, I think there are going to be lots of potential schools and colleges out there that right now aren't in the financial position to buy a you know, super-duper, high-performing wired network purely for esports. You know, they might be a year and a half, two years away from that on their, their refresh cycle. Whereas actually, if they could do this with the diligent placement of a couple of Wi-Fi 7 access points in an area underpinned by a proper network but we'll, we'll come to that yeah. another time then potentially that's a nice way uh, like an easier route to access this and dip your toe in the water and see you know see what value is this going to bring to pupils and so on so that that's why i'm excited and i'm hopeful in fact I, i'm committed to it on air now um <laughs> that we're going to provide some wi-fi 7 access points for the environment here certainly um for the arena if not for the, the gaming houses as well, just to actually test this out, because I, I really want to run a, a small tournament between classrooms, uh, maybe one team on wired, one team on Wi-Fi to start with, and then switch rooms and actually see if anybody notices the difference. 
Yeah, I think then um, I think that's the that's where we are now. It's like it? the acid yeah. test. Yeah, it? yeah. There was a Rich and I were, were chatting about this yesterday in in trying to say you broke it down for me Rich, in a really simple way when you were talking about you mentioned potholes. You're talking about lanes on a motorway. If you've got three lanes, could you just give us that analogy to help us understand sort of how those three lanes work? Yeah. So essentially, traditional Wi-Fi always had two lanes. It had a two point four gigahertz spectrum and it had a five gigahertz spectrum. Both quite contested they're on license space well as of recently the six gigahertz spectrum has also become available so that's a third lane of traffic potentially and lots of devices don't currently use six gigahertz so we can actually have those ones you know spare purely for gaming but as i said the the ingenious thing was in the past if you took your phone and i think we've all probably done this at some stage in frustration with our wi-fi at home we've gone oh I'm going to connect my phone to 2.4 gigahertz because it seems to go further. Lower frequencies, like, like when a car goes past, you always hear the bass, you don't hear the treble. It's that lower frequency travels further. So we tend to connect to that. But our devices traditionally have only been able to connect to one or the other. And it's either up to the device to make that decision or you to manually do it. As I say, with Wi-Fi 7, your device can connect to all three at the same time. I mean, what it's going to do to battery life remains to be seen. Um, but it can connect to all three of these lanes. So if one of those lanes is blocked, let's say if there's a pothole in one of those lanes, yeah. it's fine. Your phone just ignores that and travels on the two remaining lanes and then rejoins the third lane after the pothole. It's, uh, it's potentially uh, you know, going to be a game changer. Yeah, and I think, I think that's really exciting for us, especially in, in the esports environment and thinking about education is, again, when... We're having these initial conversations that could become a really quite simple solution to, to help people from their IT perspective. Absolutely. And there's a lot of people out there at the moment, they have heard about Wi-Fi 7. They're all starting to think about it. And to be honest, a lot of the time it's a case of I'm telling them, wait, <laughs> you know, you don't necessarily need to do this right now, or at least not everywhere, because there's not right now the devices that are actually going to take full advantage of it. But as I say, in situations where you've got a high density of users, what do you know, an arena or, or an assembly hall, plus you've got these, these demands on the network, so whether it's you know, video being streamed, you know, CAD designs being shared, eSports, then there's a perfect use case for it. And as I say, it's one of those things where if any prospective customer or esports customer is out there, come up to Sunderland. Yeah. Um, just generally to learn about you know what esports is all about. Because yeah. I thought I knew a fair amount about esports, but yesterday I, I genuinely had my mind blown. Um, Good. Because there's just <laughs> so much more to this. And um, one of the conversations we were having yesterday, which I don't know how we got onto this, um, but obviously we were in one of the gaming rooms um, and you know, incredible level of equipment. And one thing I was talking about was um, IoT. So actually I said, look, if you've got the, the access points that support it and the network that supports it, you know, we should be doing things to monitor energy uses because yeah. those machines are using a lot of energy, right? So yeah. what can we do around that? But it was also in performance terms, Everything makes a difference to the performance, you know, right down to, you know, having a chef for the team that's giving them the right nutrition so that they are, you know, mentally fired up uh, and ready to go. And one of the things I was thinking about was actually air quality in the rooms. You know, yeah. you've been in a room with all these machines running, kicking out heat for a length of time. What if we could have something that kicks in an air purifier at the right point and maintains that? Absolutely. And again, that's something which the boring old network is there to provide for you. I think that's the exciting thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's now, because it works, once we've got past the bit that it works, then we can do some really exciting exactly. things and we can yeah. test things and we can We're like a we smart facility, improve. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, which I think is going to be really exciting. I just want to dive into obviously what you mentioned earlier, obviously, about when, you know, when, when listen to kind of what you're saying about the, 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 the solution side of things, you know, being obviously like advocates with free sports across the board, you know, obviously well as son in college, but obviously I want to see sports the same as yourselves, you know, being, being 
shining across like everywhere in the country, you know, and there's lots of, um, I always used to chat with some of the students before and say like, you know, you know, you have like your sports days, you know, where you have like uh, schools kind of going up against each other and basic uh, athletics and things. It's like, well, why not have esports days as well? Like, yeah. how, like how easy can we get these, you know, primary schools, secondary schools set up with something that is simple enough uh, that's easy to set up and encourage them to be involved in gaming uh, at, at an earlier age to experience the, the, the positive benefits Benefits and learning how to regulate, you know, when they, when they are gaming, maybe at home and um, start, you know, getting these higher level performers from an early age and that grassroots level, you know, how how easy can we make it accessible for those colleges, even if they don't run a, um, a the BTEC esports or an esports qualification, still giving them that space even for, you know, uh, enrichment activities or just for just for a break time for students to go in pick up a controller, have a go, but having a solid experience, um, you know, without, you know, some of these staff members and IT being run off their feet all the time trying to fix these computers because they've got other things to be doing. Correct. And it just fixes that 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 kind of uh, errors that you might come across. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And I know, like, these, um, like Callum and the team are talking about, you know, whether it's, like, community hubs where, you know, schools can go in and test the, some of this stuff out. But potentially, we're also thinking of trying to package up, you know, a a good, a better, and a best kind of option of, you know, what do I need to buy to get into this, or yeah. what things do I need to tick off? You know, you know, how can we make that easier for customers? So that's that's something we're we're actively working on. Yeah, agreed. And I think just just to reiterate, I think if anyone's out there that's got any questions, today's been really insightful for me as well to hear your perspectives. Um, please do reach out. Please do get in touch. Please do come and visit us. Um, and just, I've just got one final thing for each of you. Um, Paul, just we've spoke a lot about network there today. Yeah. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about what you've seen in terms of, because that all works, actually delivering this as a program now yeah. to the students. The, there's the enrichment side, there's the student champs, and there's the qualification in an environment that's inspirational. What, what are you seeing in terms of impact on students? What is this doing for the young people that you're working with? You know, it, it it's, I always give them this analogy, you know, when it comes to like playing football and things like that, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't send, you know, people on the pitch on high heels or something. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit of a different experience, but a bit painful, you know, giving them the right gear uh, and having that sort of, a flexible network you know they come in and it's so easy they just come in they log themselves on you know if they need to pull up their games immediately it's, it's all updated it's all high speed um it's everything that they need to to so they can focus and, and keep their mindset on what's important you know when we're looking at analysis which is kind of where we're at now um you know really getting the getting the games um recorded um we're even looking into things like uh, like live stream broadcasting now and looking at different methods of capturing video or you um like think using like a ninja and such uh, to capture phone footage and then importing that into obs and having those high-speed networks allows us to be even more creative uh and kind of reach a little bit further into the higher level pro of professionalism that is the expected of the industry the students are going to get a more accurate experience as to what yeah. it's like to work in the industry which I think is the most important thing, really, yeah. uh, because rather than them, it's all just been theoretical. They get to just dive in, muck around a little bit as well, and make mistakes. And but it's all in a safe, healthy environment that they can, you know, by not clicking on the right thing, that's going to wait another twenty minutes for it to load or restart yeah. or something. Uh, and obviously, uh, I've got to mention with the with from the from the esports and the performance perspective, um, our esports teams are just at their very best all the time. Uh, you know, they, they can 100% sit down, focus on the gameplay, the analysis, the coaching. Um, it's fantastic for coaches to sit and observe um, from multiple rooms as well. It, it, it just makes things uh, very flexible and it, it, and it's a massive privilege for us to have this uh, facility available. And you can just see then with, for the students, um, you know, attendance and uh, accessibility, uh, it just inspires them uh, yeah. to, to, to want to do something exciting with their life. Yeah. And thanks so much, Paul. It's it, it just so good to hear. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's what it's all about. That's what our role is all about making. We talked about outcomes, didn't we? The people yeah. at the end. Um, that is, uh, as a resource, we're here. As a resource, we're here for all of our schools, colleges, universities. Anyone involved in esports can come and visit, can have these experience days, can have residentials by staying in the houses. So, again, please do reach out to us at British Esports if you want to come and visit the campus. Um, and then, Rich, one really important question for you. Oh, yeah. 
you'll see our lion on the table, the British Esports lion. But we've also got a little, a little puppy, Black Labrador. And then next to me here, I've got the big dog. <laughs> the big dog. <laughs> what, what, what is this all about? That logo on your T-shirt and, and this, these ruckus dogs. Where, what's this all about? Well, where, where does this come from? Who's this? This has been a logo from day one. We've always had a black Labrador as our as our logo because it's a you know reliable, trusted friend. Now over the years, the dog has got slightly larger, and then, <laughs> and then, and then more recently, slightly more muscular. Yeah, um, but it's it lives with us, and it's amazing how many people just come to us at, at various trade shows to get a plush dog. <laughs> uh, and in fact, I've I've called up. Uh, customers before and it's like, oh, you probably don't remember meeting us, you know, discussing the network, or whatever. And they went, I've got one of your dogs on my table. Um, <laughs> right. So it's it's crazy, but the power of uh, an animal as a logo is not to be underestimated. So. And there you go. We've Definitely. got those units in the beta. Absolutely, we? with your branding, got to make sure you get those animals, in there. animals yeah. in there. Customer yeah. immersion. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Get a good logo, get a good mascot, and it goes a long way. Um, gents, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for thank you. your insight and your experience. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and yeah, for anyone who's listening today, the way that's been insightful, please do feel reach, feel free to reach out to us at British Esports. And then again, if, if you need any support in your network, we can make sure that you've got that level of support and we can support you with those conversations. And absolutely, if you want to come up and see what Sunderland College are doing up here and the educational environments, uh, visits are always open. So thank you and stay tuned for the next episode. See you all soon. Cheers.